impress everybody, but I'm going to talk about democracy and what happens when democracy uh, is embraced a bit too passionately by capitalism. And since I'm an art blogger and art critic, uh, I will show a few examples of how the artists are interpreting and, and commenting on this phenomenon. I got, I got the idea of this talk a month ago. I was... Um, I was reading the Belgian press. Uh, you might know it, not know it, but something I would say miraculous happened in Belgium a month ago. We finally got a government. We have the world record of country without a government. We stayed a year and a half without any. Everything runs smoothly. Anyway, uh, it got, we, had, we had no hope anymore. It got to the point when, you know, we would check I, mean, I would check the news, and the journalists didn't bother at all uh, about what might happen to Belgium. They would talk about football, about small criminality, about what happened in other countries, but not about politics. And then in late, in late November, um, I read that the, the credit rating of Belgium one was downgraded. And to me, it didn't look like an important news, but it triggered a series of very, very, very fast events. So we got the news that suddenly Belgium was not as reliable as it used to be financially. Uh, a few days after that, the politician voted the budget, and a mere couple of days after that, we got the government. So it went very, very fast, and all that because of something related to money and finance. And since you ask, uh, our new Prime Minister is called Elio Di Rupo. He's, um, he's quite an interesting figure. He's dressed in a quite flamboy flamboyant way. He wears uh, this red bow tie. He's, a, he's the son of an Italian immigrant. He's homosexual. So I'm very proud to have him as a uh, Prime Minister. And since we are in Belgium, he's also accused of not quite mastering the language spoken by the majority of uh, Belgium, which is Dutch. Anyway. Enough about Belgium. I also spent uh, half of the year in Italy. And yeah, something quite um, important, interesting happened in Italy politically is that um, this is, by the way, Silvio Berlusconi at the time when he was a young and successful cruise singer. So Berlusconi had to demission. Not because of the scandal that you know, not because this guy obviously belongs in jail, but after pressure of the market. But you know, when you live in Italy, you don't love. Huh? It gets so he, he was replaced by, by Mario Monti. Um, I'm sure Mario Monti is a very sp respectable guy, and I'm sure he cannot do a worse job than Silvio Berlusconi. But he was not elected. Um, what was worrying is that, uh, well, he's uh, mostly an economist, and uh, he used to, to work for Goldman Sachs, the US investment bank, which I recently uh, read is, uh, as a nickname in the US press, is called the uh, um, Vampire Squid. So I used to work for them. And I'm really not into conspiracy theories, but I think I got this mark from The Independent, or serious English newspaper, but then yeah, you have Mario Monti who used to work for Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs, and yeah, he was, he's now at the head of the country. In Greece, something similar happened. Um, they have a new prime minister, he has not been elected, he used to be, uh, to be at the head of the central bank of Europe, and he also had dealings with Goldman Sachs. The new head of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, also uh, used to work at Goldman Sachs. So there's a quite, you know, it's, as I say, I'm not do, at all into conspiracy theories, but this is probably not very healthy. I don't want to scare you, but they're not just <laughs> banks and vampires which should be worried about, but also corporations. If you have a look. This is not an updated, uh, the latest list, but it's the only one I found online. If you look at the list as, at the biggest, the largest economic entities in the world, almost half of them are not countries, they are corporations. So of course, the 20 something first are countries, but suddenly you see emerge uh, Walmart, General Motors, Exxon, etc. So it means that, uh, for example, Walmart has um, higher annual revenues than the 
general, how do you say it in English, general domestic product of countries which are very populous or of countries which are less populous but we would, which we would regard as really well off. So, you know, that got me a lot into thinking and I realized a lot of artists actually uh, have been there before me and have, have been investigated and trying to explore and comment on the way politics and, and finance are always so closely embraced to each other. I will just give a few examples. Um, one of them is a video I saw, I saw a few months ago. So the artist actually documented, he made a video of uh, a five-day training camp in uh, Wales, but there are these kind of tra training camps exist in other parts of the UK and also in the US mostly. And you learn how to survive in what, what they call hostile um, and challenging environment. And the kind of people who attend these um, training camps uh, are not action heroes, they are normal people, they are actually employees of corporations. So these camps are made especially for corporations who want to extend um, their business in these so-called hostile uh, territories where there are war or where there's a lot of danger. And so they send their employees to get trained before being sent to Iraq to, Iraq to you know, open an office or something like that. They learn how to respond to bombing, how to respond to when you're kidnapped, kidnapped by guerrillas, um, what happens when uh, one of you is in danger and is, you know, how to, how to save him, how to navigate through minefields. So, yeah, there's a website in case you're interested in following this kind of training. Uh, it's a private company, but the trainers are mostly um, British ex-Special Force soldiers. So, as I said, these are, these are civilians. So, if the corporations uh, start to, to know how to defend themselves, what, what would happen if, if they decide to bypass um, a state and if they decide to take their defense on their own interest in their own end and, and kind of arm themselves? I know it might sound, it might sound a little bit ex extreme, but yeah, if I had more time, I would expand on that. And these corporations be, can be quite wide-ranging. A few years ago, over 10 years ago, Joshan mapped all the, all the 100 top uh, corporations in the US and he realized that uh, a few things which were hidden from the public is that the same individual can be at the board of five, six, or seven different corporations and also have some uh, governmental position. And not only is, there, is that guy at the head of several, several um, the board of several corporations, but these corporations sometimes don't even think, seem to have anything to do together, and in other cases, they even seem to be um, competitive. So this, um, this, few, this few first example showed how artists are really exposing uh, to the public and showing what's going on and what we are, I mean, corporations would prefer, prefer to keep uh, to themselves. And now the two uh, next examples of, of artistic projects are of artists who build whole scenarios thinking what would happen if the situation of capitalism and democracy goes to other extremes. So the first artist is Zoe Papadopoulou. She's uh, also a designer, she's based now in, in London, but she's from, uh, she's a Greek Cypriot. And, uh, well, you might know that things in Greece are not going fantastically well, but already in 2008, uh, she imagined what, what would happen if the solution to all the, pro the uh, economical problem of, of uh, Cyprus were in merging with, um, with a corporation. And she got the idea because uh, she discovered a, U, a, a EU precedent. Uh, in 2006, um, the UK Olympic Committee uh, trademarked and really protected a certain association of worlds linked to the Olympics. So, for example, London 2012 is, is, is trademarked, protected. And so she thought, well, that's very weird because the Olympics, they, don't be, they shouldn't belong to the UK if we... If, 
if you think about it, the, the Olympics were invented in Greece. So what would happen if we would do the same with everything that the Greeks had invented, anything that could be traced back to them? Maybe we could make a lot of money uh, out of it. And, and, you know, our economy would be so much better than the rest, the, the one that the rest of Europe. So Cyprus looked around and decided to uh, merge with Intel because Intel is, uh, you know, they would bring to the table uh, a host of lawyers and experts. Intel is quite famous for making money through protecting intellectual property. And they would look at every single service or object we have in our contemporary life that could be traced back to an invention from ancient Greek. And if you think about it, there's quite a lot. There's, if you think about language, architecture, science, technology, etc. So that got to the point that um, Cyprus merges with, uh, with Intel, and Cyprus decides, well, what about modernizing another and quite, quite popular invention of the Greek? What happens if we decide to modernize democracy? And instead of having a prime minister or a president, we would go, be governed by a CEO. And the CEO would just, you know, uh, see to that that all the problems are, are fixed uh, with efficiency and, and fast, because I guess most people in Cyprus, as in many parts of Europe, are not very happy with, with their politicians. Um, but then why would Intel merge with Cyprus? Because after all, Intel could buy Cyprus bit by bit. That's because... Um, the Greek also invented in the year 100 before Christ the first, um, the first computer. So it was completely forgotten. It was lost until in uh, 1901. Uh, this, this bit of technology was found in a shipwreck. Uh, scientists spent decades and decades trying to understand what it was. And yeah, apparently is the first uh, analog computer, and it was used to calculate quite precisely the position of um, celestial objects and also to forecast when eclipse would happen and, and other kinds of things. So that means that that's the key to the castle for, for Intel. If they, if they merge with Cyprus and they, you know, they monitor um, um, copyright and all the trademark of every single thing that could be traced back to a, to a Greek invention, that would involve also com the computers and the whole line of production of computers, including anything that has to do with computers and which is sold or handled by their concurrent. So that was, that was just a, a first project of someone who wanted to, to go further with this idea of um, capitalism and, and democracy. And the last far more sinister project is um, Slave City by Atelier Van Lieshout. And they've been working since 2005 into trying to develop a city, um, quite a small town actually, uh, inhabited by over 200,000 uh, people, uh, which would be, would be uh, living completely in autarky, autarcy, I don't know how to pronounce it and would be completely green. It would be the first zero emission city of this size. Everything would be monitored and run according to extreme efficiency, uh, following um, principles that, that, lead, that lead to profit and ecology. And the way it would work is that um, the people living, living in the city are called the participants. The participants, um, have to do their job so that the city will be really profitable and, and really green and nothing is wasted and everything is recycled. So they will work in shift of seven hours they would spend, spend in a um, uh, call center, you know, working in computer um, advice. Uh, seven hours after they would spend them in workshops, in the fields, in surveillance to you know, to ensure that the city runs smoothly, they would have seven hours to sleep and three hours to um, relax, sleep, and eat. And so obviously this would be a very successful model. Um, the Atelier Von Lieshout 
which has run in the past uh, like real experiment of, of, of cities, but not quite like this one. It would generate profit of 7 billion euro every year, so that's, that's, that's quite attractive. And as I say, it's a very green city, zero emission, nothing is wasted, no energy comes from outside, only wind and, and, and sun and biogas. And since everybody has to do their job and it has to be profitable, uh, all the citizens are monitored. And, and there's always someone who's checking, that, ensuring that they do their bit. So if they notice at some point that one of the participants is not you know, he's getting old, he's sick. Well, then it's not useful anymore to work. So it has to be recycled. And an efficient way to recycle this old or sick participant is to uh, um, yeah, throw his body in the biogas digester and turn it into energy. If this uh, not very useful anymore participant is not working well, but he's still young and quite healthy, then he can be recycled in another way. Part of his body would be part of the organ transplant program, and the rest would, uh, would be sent to the meat processing facility. So this is quite a uh, dystopian project, and I think I will leave the conclusion to you. Is it, is it something that might happen, might materialize? Does our government, our society have enough safeguards to ensure that this would never happen? Or is it just something that is and will remind in the, in the minds of the science fiction writers and contemporary artists.